Welcome, I'm Matt Reiners, co-founder of Eversound, and with me today is Larry Carlson, president and CEO of United Methodist Communities. Today, we're going to be exploring technology's role in operations and occupancy. In my years getting to know Larry and the United Methodist Communities team, I can honestly say they're one of the few groups who take technology seriously. They're not afraid to innovate and do what's best for their people. Thanks for joining us today, Larry. Happy to be here. Awesome. So let's hop right into it. Yeah, so American Healthcare Association President and CEO Mark Parkinson said last month that long-term care operators will have to rebuild occupancy by at least 1% per month during 2021 in order for it to reach its pre-pandemic levels. I'm curious, what strategies is United Methodist Communities implementing to meet this benchmark? Yeah, so... Yeah, I think that's uh, probably a pretty on target uh, estimate, although it, it really depends on the product line. We're finding, uh, you know, healthcare is going to rebound, I think, really quickly, you know, once people are vaccinated and uh, once uh, elective surgeries are, are, are back on, on track. I, you know, memory care has been pretty consistent for us over the, the uh, pandemic. And so really, for us, the big hit is coming around assisted living, which is a much more of a... Uh, you know, not as much of a need-based uh, product. So um, I, I think there is about a year's worth of a pent-up demand. And um, I, I think once people feel safe, they're going to come back. Um, however, I, you know, for us in assisted living, we, we probably need to be looking more like a 2% uh, okay. increase in order to be back to pre-pandemic pre by the end of the year. And have these strategies to kind of like hit that 2% or that 1%, depending on the product line, have they changed in terms of what you're doing compared to pre-pandemic? Well, sure, because there's so much focus on, uh, you know, safety these days. And so we actually, uh, you know, went in and created a program that we call United for Safety. And uh, so, you know, we bought uh, some equipment and tools and uh, really put some programs together that we can you know, provide an environment that we believe is safe uh, so that uh, anybody who's coming in would have that sense of safety. I think the, the other strategy that we've done during the pandemic is we uh, converted the quarantine into what I, what we call a staycation. Mm. Um, every, nobody wanted to hear the word quarantine, obviously. And so a staycation sounded a little bit nicer. And uh, we try to make uh, those, uh, those days of quarantine a little bit more uh, friendly. And so somebody's always stopping by and somebody's bringing something in and trying to really engage our new uh, residents into the community while they, uh, you know, are serving out that uh, staycation period. You know, that along with virtual tours, Zoom meetings with prospects and really relational selling, which we've always been sort of a relational selling strategy, but it's really um, an opportunity to talk quite frankly with our prospects, like, what do you really miss the most? Mm. And then have our sales staffs come around and, and try to figure that out for them. So if they really miss not be, being able to go to Starbucks, well, they go out in Starbucks and get them a coffee and drop it off at the house then. It's just really pushing those relationships. Uh, and because the pandemic is so much in everybody's face, um, it's not the untouchable conversation because if you don't talk about it, it's there's something really wrong. So um, really embracing what's going on and, and uh, be re having our sales staff be real. Yeah, I think it's important that uh, that level of transparency, right? I think you you hit it right on the head. If you're not talking about it, there's definitely something wrong. And I love how you're right. calling it a staycation because yeah. words definitely matter and to consider it that rather than quarantining. I mean, I'm, who doesn't like a little nice little staycation? Right. Um, and, uh, you know, so while operators, it's, it feels like we're, we're starting to see this light at the end of the tunnel with, you know, the vaccine and, and how that's being rolled out. Um, and many are recognizing that the other side of the tunnel has opened up almost like this new era or this new normal, I know is kind of the buzzword that a lot of people mm -hmm. like to use for senior living operations. Um, I'm curious, what does this mean for United Methodist communities and how are you thinking about this new era? So it's really trying to like take the lessons learned from uh, the, the pandemic period of time and, and weave them into what we are normally going to be doing moving forward. And that really comes back to the whole notion of safety. Uh, you know, folks are not going to move in until they feel safe. So uh, with everybody vaccinated, and we're about 98% of our residents vaccinated and awesome. 
about 75% of our staff are vaccinated. And although I'm not thrilled with that 75% number, I'd like it to be more like 90. Um, I understand that's about 20% above the national average in senior living. So um, I guess I'll feel somewhat good about that. But, yeah. you know, until we can get everybody vaccinated and, and get the communities back operating again and get group dining going again and group group activities going again and create a normal life. Um, that's what the new normal is going to be. So we need to promote the safety thing. I think the other thing that we've really learned through the pandemic is how to increase the trust factor uh, mm -hmm. between our, our uh, communities and, and our family members. And that was really driven by technology. And it's so, you know, sort of interesting that um, the adoption of technology um, probably was compressed from about five years to eight weeks last spring. Wow. Um, because everybody was forced to, to use it. And so, uh, you know, we had virtual Easter dinner with families uh, that we set up. Um, you know, at one time, if we had a family council meeting, uh, we probably had six or eight families who would show up. And now all of a sudden with the Zoom family council meetings, we have 75 people showing up. Now, granted, the topic of the, the discussion was a little bit more, uh, uh, you know, in your face, so to speak. But nonetheless, the families have really appreciated the fact that they can tune in once a week with the executive director, find out exactly what's going on. Um, and so the level of communication has just gone off on steroids, so to speak, and it's really been technology that's allowed us to do that. And families, I think the trust factor has increased. And I think that's a dis selling distinctive as we as we move into the new normal. And we certainly don't want to lose that. I, th I think that's something we have gained through this and and we need to keep that. So I don't see us ever going back to uh, in-person family council meetings, except maybe for on occasion. But I think these, uh, uh, you know, Zoom family council meetings are they're here to stay. Yeah. And it's almost like technology, what my experience has been, it, it allows you to scale some of the efforts and really to, you know, include people from all over the world, really, in, in order to do that. And so you talk about like the communication side of things, which I think transparency is key, right, to like be talking about this, having those meetings with your executive directors and really continuing to build that trust with the families, which you guys do such a, a great job in, in doing. Um, have you seen other needs be filled by technology? Well, let's let's face it. Um, tech can't replace human touch and compassion, and so that's always going to be the hallmark of um, any senior living provider, or at least it should be. Um, but I, you know, I think there are there are some tech that uh, we are using. Uh, we use uh, just to name a few. Uh, K4 Connect is a product we use for communication. Uh, Virtue Sense. We've we, you know we got a uh, a grant from the FCC last spring um, to. Uh, to do some virtue sense, which is a, a balance product as well as a uh, an, an alert product to reduce uh, falls, and uh, one that monitors um, respirations, pulse, and, and other, those kinds of things. And then uh, Eversound has has been uh, a very good product for us, especially as it came to family visitation. I mean, we were able to uh, have our uh, residents, families. Uh, uh, meet each other and they could actually hear each other on two sides of a window or two sides of a wall. And that was very helpful. And then also as he rolled it out through our group activities, uh, you know, hallway activities, uh, it, was, it was a very important product so that people uh, could really hear what's going on and engage. So very important. And then lastly, it's never too late, which is a great uh, in resident engagement tool that uh, we use uh, quite a bit around all of our communities. So I think you know operators need to be proactive with tech to enhance care and and use them as tools for the staff to be more effective and uh, efficient. Yeah, no, it makes total sense. And you know, I remember when we first met, and you you definitely embrace technology, which I, I have to give you and your entire organization props for. Are there any lessons learned in terms of uh, adopting technology for for better or for worse? Sure. So yeah, there are there are a few. So first, uh, don't be afraid of tech um, and just understand what tech can bring to you. Uh, trial a bunch of different technologies, but don't be afraid to fail. Uh, just fail quickly and move on. 
and then translate that failure into learning. And uh, you know, we've we've piloted uh, any number of, of products over the last couple of years uh, from uh, some falls detections by two guys who were working in a garage in Southern California, sort of a classic <laughs> tech story, right? Um, to this FCC grant, which was uh, uh, fabulous uh, in, in, in our outcomes, we reduced falls in the uh, 80 uh, units that we were trialing uh, by 72%. You might have seen that uh, white paper we posted last week on week on LinkedIn. It was uh, really pretty impressive. And you know, aside from the fact that people aren't falling and getting hurt, um, you know, a lot of our professional liability comes as a result of a fall. And so the extent to which we can reduce falls, we're, we're saving everybody a, a, a lot of pain, both uh, literally and uh, monetarily, so to speak. Yeah, no, it makes sense. And, and congratulations on the number 72. That is, that is awesome. So it is, it is awesome. Doing, yeah. And it is, it's interesting, you know, we, we got so many units when we started with the grant and then the nursing staff got so excited about the results that they wanted more. So, uh, you know, one of our fears going into the grant was, you know, how would the adoption be with this staff really embrace it? Uh, and they fully have, especially when they realize the, the impact that uh, it can have. Yeah. And I, and I feel like, you know, highlighting and adopting these technologies and, and making these investments into the technology, like how do you you know, to me, it makes perfect sense of how that will help rebuild occupancy. But I'm curious of your guys' take and approach in, in adopting technology. You know, how have you seen these investments or how do you believe these investments will help to rebuild that occupancy number? Well, you know, it really ties back to our mission. Um, and uh, the tech allows our staff to know our residents better and promotes our relationship oriented care. And uh, so the extent to which um, we get to understand who, who our residents are. It's all individual. And I think that translates into uh, occupancy. Uh, you know, we, we were not made to live in isolation. Uh, we were made to live in community. And right now people have been afraid to live in community with uh, rightly so. Uh, but really at the end of the day, um, our prospects are better off living in one of our communities, um, both socially and, and from a safety perspective. Mm -hmm. And once we're able to articulate that uh, story and, and deliver on it, um, this pent up demand is gonna show up in our doorstep. And I think we're gonna be uh, much better off having lived through this nightmare of this past year. Yeah, no, it's awesome. And some really good insights and just thoughts there. And I appreciate you, you sharing that and kind of, you know, peeling back the curtain a little bit to let us into all the amazing things that United Methodist Communities is doing. And, you know, in closing, can you share any other key takeaways or learnings that you've had um, of what other providers can do? I think at the end of the day, we need to stay true to our mission. And then, and the transparency and communication is paramount. I, you know, I think if, if people are, are looking at being reflective of that of, of themselves within the context of you know where they are, um, that's going to go a long way in, in allowing them to deliver on uh, what they want to do and uh, be successful. I need to give you a microphone to drop after that. Um, <laughs> no, it makes it makes total sense, right? And you know, transparency and building the relationship, and you guys taking that approach and, and really keeping communication top of mind and, and going above and beyond. It's it's no wonder why you guys are one of the leaders in this space and. You know, I want to thank you for, for taking the time to kind of share more about that uh, with us here today. You bet. Happy, happy to do so. Awesome. Well, thanks everyone for joining and we'll hope to see you next time around.